There we go. So for, to, for today's seminar, I think we're really privileged to have two very excellent speakers who are going to speak for about 15 minutes each, leaving ample time for questions and answers at the end. I'm going to start with a very short intro to provide a bit of context before handing over to Jake Phillips from Sheffield Hallam University, who's editor of Probation Quarterly, and then Professor Nicola Carr from Nottingham University, who's editor of the Probation Journal. I'll then open it up to questions and answers, and please put your questions in. You'll see the Q&A tab at the top of the screen. I uh, hope you find the event really useful. I only really want to make two points as part of an introduction. Miranda, would you show my slide, please? So the first is really that the number of community sentences have uh, fallen almost in half from over 134,000 in 2013 to 68,000 in 2023, while short prison sentences are down by just over a third. <clears throat> so this chart shows and compares community sentences, short prison sentences of less than 12 months, 12 months or less, and suspended sentences. So part of the decline is because of there are few people, fewer people going through the courts. But I think the key fact is that 10 years ago, community sentences made up 55% of these three types of disposal for people that were on the cusp of, of, of custody and prison sentences made up just 18 and a half percent. Ten years later, the proportion of community sentences has dropped to 45.6 percent, while prison has increased at well over a quarter, 27.2. Penal reformers and the government have frequently spoken about how we should use short prison sentences less and community options more. As you know, at the moment, there's legislation going through Parliament to introduce a presumption against short sentences. However, everything we read about this, certainly in the, in the media, there's very little discussion about what community sentences should be. In fact, we, we tend to just get one main theme, which is that they should be tough and or robust or demanding. And there's very little detail on well, what do we actually mean by these adjectives? The only thing that we seem to see is more tagging and seemingly unlimited amounts of unpaid work. And this seems to apply across the political spectrum. Tony Blair's think tank recently published an analysis of the criminal justice system, which I thought did a decent job of analysing the problems, recommending structural change and the way that um, we need a more Apologies for that. A more joined up approach. Um, but when it actually got to the point of saying, well, how can we restore faith in the probation service? The only thing it could advocate for um, improving the confidence of sentences in the probation service was that we could have more unpaid work. Anyway, that's why we're doing the event today. I'm now keen to push over uh, straight away to Jake Phillips to share some of his most recent research with us. Thanks very much, uh, Russell, uh, for the invitation to, to be part of this event. And thanks to the Centre for Justice Innovation for uh, agreeing to me uh, speaking. Uh, and thank you to everybody for coming. My name is Jake Phillips. Um, as Russell said, uh, I'm a reader in criminology at Sheffield Hallam University, and I'm going to talk today about uh, some research that I've been doing recently uh, with a group of colleagues, uh, which has been looking at the concept of hope uh, in probation. And I'm going to use the findings from the interviews that we did uh, with people who have had various types of involvement with uh, probation uh, to think about what I think makes for a good uh, community sentence. Uh, so the research has been uh, done with uh, Adam Ali, Anita Dockley, Steve Barrell, Sarah Lewis and 
Cam Stevens. Uh, we're kind of a fairly diverse group, people with um, kind of more academic focus, uh, former practitioners, people with experience of being uh, in prison and under probation uh, supervision. Uh, and we kind of brought all our kind of perspectives and, and different experiences and expertise uh, together on this uh, project. So I wanted to start off just by uh, talking a little bit about what we might mean uh, by hope. So there is a huge kind of body of literature on hope kind of from psychology, political philosophy, uh, philosophy uh, itself um, and um, so on. Uh, Schneider's theory of hope is probably one of the most kind of well known. Uh, his theory kind of posits that hope is the perceived capacity uh, capability to derive pathways to desired goals, motivate oneself by agency, uh, thinking to use those pathways. So it's a very kind of cognitive uh, definition situated and, and dependent on uh, people having agency and um, the ability to think their way to achieving uh, what they want. So it's a way of thinking uh, which is focused on either achieving goals, positive goals, or focused on kind of deterring or delaying uh, more negative goals. For people to have hope, um, most of the academic literature suggests that people need to believe that there is some possibility of achieving that goal. If there's no possibility, then that might be described as kind of false hope or blind optimism or something like that. Uh, for kind of true hope uh, to exist, there needs to be uh, a sense, a belief that, you know, it, it, it is achievable, uh, even if it's potentially quite remote. This project started really from a discussion between initially Anita Dockley, who used to be at the Howard League for Penal Reform, now works for an organisation called Justice Futures. Uh, which is set up recently, uh, and Steve Farrell, and we were talking about hope uh, in the criminal justice system and how, based on that kind of definition of hope, it's clearly an important aspect uh, for change, uh, kind of for individuals. And, you know, if you look across literature that, from criminology, you'll find that hope and having hope is linked to kind of positive outcomes. Uh, it's been shown to help people survive uh, the difficult conditions that people experience when in prison, uh, having hope has been linked to reduced reoffending, desistance, uh, and so on. But there's very little research that's been done on hope specifically in kind of probation, community justice uh, type settings. Most of it's been focused on kind of prison and then that uh, release from uh, prison, and even then, not not huge amounts. So we really wanted to hone in on uh, hope in the context of probation and community justice. So that's people serving community sentences, uh, but also uh, to some extent post-release supervision. Um, just in terms of kind of thinking about what hope is, uh, there's a useful framework uh, from Seeds uh, 2022 uh, in which he breaks down hope into two types of hope. So kind of institutional hope, uh, and transformational hope. And I think that's a really useful uh, distinction uh, when we're thinking about what might make for a good community sentence. So institutional hope is hope that people have that might be tied very much to kind of institutional rules uh, and contexts. Uh, so for example, it might be the hope of just getting to the end of an order without being breached, coping with the pains of imprisonment. Uh, hoping for a successful appeal or a resentencing, something like that. So I guess relatively short term and very much based on the fact that, you know, the people are in the criminal justice system. And then he identifies a kind of a transformational hope. So this is hope which is not invested in those existing structures, uh, but it begins with the loss of structure um, and then is a, is a transformative uh, process a process of reorient reorientation, uh, working towards a future that is not known. Uh, it might be, you know, partly defined. You might know where you are hoping uh, to get to, but necessarily that journey getting there um, is not always going to be kind of defined and certainly is not always uh, predictable. 
So we had some kind of broad uh, research questions that we helped, uh, that we used to kind of help guide uh, what we did in our research. Um, so we were primarily interested in what hope looks like in the context of probation. Uh, and then kind of sub questions, what do practitioners and people on probation hope to get out of probation? How does probation enable people to have hope and what gets in the way of this? Uh, and then how can probation create the conditions for more hopeful futures? And I'm going to try and focus if I can move quickly enough through on that final point there. If you want to know more about the project, there's a link there uh, for penal reform solutions uh, slash hope. Uh, so Sarah Lewis uh, worked on the project with us. She uh, heads up penal reform uh, solutions as a brief kind of report on there and a podcast um, that we recorded a couple of weeks ago. So just quickly in terms of method, we really wanted to kind of uh, co-produce this research with people who were and have been uh, in the system as practitioners and as people who have been punished. Uh, and we started off by doing a, a group of a bunch of walking groups uh, in which we had fairly wide ranging conversations with people with lived experience of criminal justice so people who've been on probation over a number of years. Uh, and people who had worked uh, in probation and we walked to the village of Hope uh, in the Peak District. Uh, there's a picture on the top right there of one of the walks, the one walk where we got absolutely stunning weather. They weren't all quite like that. We recruited people from a range of different uh, organisations and we used those walks to basically kind of get some ideas, discuss hope, gauge interest and, and think about how we might go about asking questions about hope. Uh, and, and they were great. We loved those walks. Um, we would have liked to do more to actually collect data, but we weren't given uh, permission by HMPPS to do walking groups with people on probation. But nonetheless, we use those uh, kind of walks to then create our interview schedules uh, as a whole team. Um, and uh, then as a team, we went off and we did uh, 52 uh, interviews in total uh, with a range of people. So they were very much kind of semi-structured uh, interviews uh, carried out by some, you know, the, the diverse kind of team uh, that, that we make up. Uh, and we we carried out the thematic analysis. We're still in the process of kind of fully kind of analysing uh, the data, but you'll see from the table there, there was a nice mix of people who were on probation or had been on probation, former and current probation staff, people who were kind of working around the criminal justice system, policy makers, and then kind of some other stakeholders. Okay, so let's get into kind of the data. So what uh, did our participants say is the function of hope? Um, and I think this quote here uh, kind of really nicely sums up uh, what hope could be all about in the context of probation. It's about instilling in people that they're talented, skilled, uh, that they can have meaning in their lives. And once they find that, once they reorientate themselves to that, then they're going to fly, have an opportunity to live. Uh, a peaceful life, having hope in other people, recognising that, um, yes, they might have had challenging situations which have led them to where they are, but that's not kind of the end. Uh, and the aim of having hope can provide energy, provide motivation, provide engagement um, so that people can realise uh, that their lives uh, can be better. When we talk to people on probation, uh, what they hope to get from being on probation. We got, you know, a number of uh, responses. There's just a few uh, on the screen there from, you know, good job to get clean, uh, to just avoid getting recalled uh, and so on. And if we, um, we also heard <clears throat> kind of from some people, a sense of hopelessness. Uh, so, you know, I, I have no hope at that time. Um, I was, uh, you know, when this person started probation, the probation officer was just an authority figure. I was rebelling against any sort of authority. I just saw them as the police and that was it. I didn't want to get uh, anything out of it. There was quite a lot of hopelessness uh, in our data, quite a lot of hopelessness about the state of uh, probation uh, in particular and about how uh, probation at the moment is not really set up to 
deliver hope, I guess, and I, I'm going to touch on that briefly. I don't want to dwell on that too much today. We heard a lot of uh, institutional hope from our participants as well. So that's the hope that's very much tied to those kind of institutional bulls and contexts. So I just wanted to get it over and done with so I could carry on with my life. I didn't hope to get anything. It was just an inconvenience. It's about getting through what you've been sentenced to. Um, so, uh, you know, just might be looking for a bit of support, uh, but really it's about just not being a negative uh, and there perhaps being uh, a positive. So I guess that's kind of fairly kind of short term uh, hope, uh, very much tied to the institution. But we did hear examples of, you know, kind of transformational hope uh, as well. So there's a quote here. This came from a former probation practitioner talking about uh, a young man that she'd worked with um, who, you know, wanted better for himself. Uh, he wanted to, you know, not have the same as what his family had had. He wanted a nice house, nice car, the normal hopes, the normal things that people want to. He wasn't sure how he was going to get there. You know, if we think back to that quote about transformational hope from seeds, that route to getting to where he wanted to get to was unknown and uncertain. But he had that goal. Uh, he wanted to be a manager in Railtrack. He wanted to earn decent money. He knew there was things he needed to get there. Uh, and he, the probation officer, felt like her job was to work out how to get there. He had his hopes, his dreams, and it was her job to kind of support him uh, to kind of travel that path, I guess. We heard a lot about then what gets in the way uh, of hope uh, and I'm going to kind of go over these bits uh, fairly quickly because for anybody on the call who has had much to do with probation recently, I don't think any of this is going to be particularly uh, surprising. Um, but there's this quote here from an IPP licensed uh, prisoner who was who was under probation uh, supervision. Uh, talks about how, you know, being on a on a sentence and, you know, they talked about being an unlawful sentence, so very IPP specific. Uh, but all those strings attached, daggers, knives, they're, you know, they're looking to haul you back in, telling you if you fail, we fail. Uh, kind of like sums up some of the mood uh, that we got there. We heard a lot about, um, you know, the ticks box, cult, tick box culture that features uh, in probation. And I think this quote here, the tick box culture is a way in which you can completely dehumanize someone in the span of a 10 minute phone call uh, is really quite telling about how people experience that. You know, on the other end, it drowns hope. Uh, it, it prevents practitioners from seeing people's uh, strengths. Workloads, again, you know, we know that uh, that's a major issue uh, in probation at the moment, so I won't uh, dwell on that either. People talked to us about how they felt like probation was really just about kind of compliance uh, and monitoring. Uh, so very limited, just, you know, everything on repeat. What are you doing? How are things? Have you found anything? Is there anything we can help with? Great. I'll speak again in two uh, minutes. Just a monitoring service. Uh, and this participant said it did feel like it was a bit uh, hopeless. You expect probation to be there, uh, but it wasn't. Uh, for this person. People talked, and this was staff and people on probation, talked about that kind of lack of flexibility and how that um, can get in the way of people having hope. Uh, it can hinder people, diminish their hopes because they start to see probation as a cruel kind of punishment. So that lack of discretion around enforcement, uh, that, that, that focus, that way in which probation has been toughened up uh, in recent years, as Russell kind of alluded to, is around being stricter with enforcement. And that was seen to kind of hinder people's hopes. Uh, and a former practitioner uh, talked about why they left, because they were being dictated to in terms of, you know, what uh, they should uh, be doing. Again, we heard a lot about the focus on risk uh, and how that can dash hopes. Um, we have to risk management risk manage people, but that is nearly always then against somebody's uh, hope. So it's about, of course, we need probation is about managing risk. That's absolutely what probation practitioners have to do. Um, but uh, it can, uh, it can, it need, there needs to be a balance. And I think probably our participants, if you put them all together, would say the balance at the moment is wrong. 
there's too much focus on assessing and manage, managing risk and not enough on kind of growth and building uh, hope. Uh, similarly, with that kind of focus on punishment, it was seen to diminish the trust. Uh, and then we heard quite a bit about um, marketized and rationed kind of rehabilitative services and how that makes it then more difficult for practitioners to help people uh, achieve their hopes because there aren't enough kind of community uh, resources. So what makes for a good community sentence? Well, luckily for us, our participants did also talk about, well, what they would want to get uh, from probation. And I like this quote from Seamus Heaney. So hope is not autumn, uh, optimism, which expects things to turn out well, but something rooted in the conviction that there is good worth working for. I don't think I mean that people on probation are, you know, are, you know, have false hopes, wildly optimistic. But I think the idea that probation could work or should work in a way which moves people towards living their lives where they feel like there is uh, something good worth work working for, worth uh, living for, is a good way to go. So how would our participants say that should be done? So really, really kind of strong theme that came out of the data was treating people as people. This is not a new idea. Um, in fact, I don't probably think very much of this is groundbreakingly new. But I think it's really interesting to that it, you know these things come up time and time again. So we had quite a few quotes where people were like, when they talked about their positive experiences of probation, they they talked they talked about how people for once treated them like a human being and how that was really important and it gave them kind of hope for the future. Uh, people talked about how uh, trust is really really important and how you need time. Uh, to build trust and we've heard loads of examples about how that trust and can then be used uh, to first of all encourage people to engage and then once people are engaged you can start to work out with them uh, what they might hope for and how they might go about kind of achieving those hopes. Co-production uh, is really important. Uh, this is, you know, I know that there's been work done in probation around trying to uh, improve the extent to which people on probation are involved and are able to kind of co-produce the work that they do when they are on uh, probation. I think what's interesting about this from my perspective is that it, our participants kind of suggested it doesn't really take very much to co-produce or it shouldn't take very much uh, to co-produce. Uh, uh, kind of sentence community work uh, with people. Uh, it kind of should be just kind of fundamental. We heard quite a bit about how probation could be delivered differently. So in more kind of warm and welcoming environments, more kind of multidisciplinary hubs, uh, there needs to be much stronger focus on uh, strengths. So risk assessments can identify, yes, risks and weaknesses, but also strengths. And again, I know probation uh, the probation service is working on that and it's you know a new risk assessment tool is is coming uh, uh, on stream soon hopefully and then finally related to workloads um, I've left this to last because this is almost like obvious but it was really clear from the data that you know staff need more time to be able to deliver kind of good community sentences but they also need to be treated well so uh, just to conclude, uh, there was a lack of hope across participants. Um, you know, the, the, the data was kind of negative, but we are able when we look in the data to identify the fact that people had a sense at least of what probation should be about in terms of hopes, uh, that probation should be able to facilitate hopes. We've identified kind of a number of structural and cultural factors that impede the facilitation and nurturing uh, of people's hopes. And I think, you know, if we're going to answer that question, what is a good community sentence? I think it's one which helps people move from states of hopelessness or from having very institutional type hopes towards that kind of more transformational hopefulness and having the conviction uh, that there is something good worth living for. Uh, in their lives and I think that those ideas from those last few slides are ways in which probation could go about doing that. Okay, that's me done. I'm sorry if I ran over a little bit, Russell. 
Uh, but thank you very much. You're forgiven, Jay. Thank you very much. And and thank you very much for that focus on the end, because I think we all know that it's it's a struggle to be on probation. It's a struggle to be to work in probation at the moment. But to see that positive end point, which is obviously things that lots of practitioners are working towards in terms of hope, building trust, working together and, and looking at strengths as well as risks. So straight on to you. Please, Nicola. So, Professor Nicola Carr from the University of Nottingham. Thanks, Russell. Can I just check if my slides showing there? Yeah, yeah, we can yeah, see that, right. Nicola. Okay, great. Sorry. Okay, so thank you. And uh, I think what I'm going to say, and thanks, Jake, for that presentation, it brought to mind um, Seamus Heaney's quote of it when hope and history rhyme. Uh, justice happens. So uh, there's a nice kind of resonance there to what you said. Um, what I'm going to be focusing on today, uh, taking on board the topic of what we're looking at, what is a good community sentence, is uh, exploring some of um, the our current research and a project I'm involved in, looking at staff experiences of um, the in England and Wales at uh, the process of uh, since unification. Uh, thinking a little bit about what good uh, in a good community sentence might look like by drawing on some uh, work I and other colleagues have done in a in a book called Reimagining Probation Practice, and then to draw through some of the current challenges which Jake has touched upon, and I'm sure many people on this call will be familiar with, and then think about scope for change. So I'm setting myself a target of 15 minutes, a uh, lot to cover, but hopefully we'll have time for uh, discussion as well. So the project context I'm drawing on, it's a three year project. Uh, we're currently in the third year. We started in January 2022, where we're looking at um, basically probation in England and Wales following uh, unification. Uh, it's a project invol involving this team. I'm contractually obliged to show everybody's photographs every time we do this presentation. So there it all is. Um, and the uh, data that I'm drawing on is um, it's a large project involving kind of national, regional and local. Um, sorry, um, Nicola, I'm just going to interrupt. I can't see your slides anymore. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Thanks, Jake. You beat me to Thank you. Yeah. Um, one second. I don't know what happened there. They're showing now? Uh, just loading. We can just see like it's not on slideshow view, but we can see. Okay. Um, yeah. And then it goes back to you, unfortunately. Okay. It doesn't. Um, Miranda, I'm just, Miranda, so Miranda, Miranda share? to share. Yeah. Um, while Miranda's hopefully uh, sharing, I'll just um, I'll just provide some context on the project because I'm just conscious of our time. So the overall uh, project um, is uh, a large project looking at uh, probation in England and Wales. It involves a number of different levels, um, the kind of senior policymaker level, um, criminal justice stakeholders, so people who interact with probation, such as magistrates, uh, parole board and police and crime commissioners the regional directors, all of them across the country. And uh, then we have a case study area, in one of the probation regions, one of the 12 regions where we've been uh, interviewing staff. We're going back for the third time this year to um, we're doing follow up interviews with staff over a course of three years. So what I want to draw on today is those interviews with staff about some of the context and what's happening for them in relation to um, the, the constraints and the structures under which they work on. Um, I'm also just drawing, uh, as I mentioned, on this notion of what is good, a good sentence uh, by, by thinking about rehabilitation more broadly. And I know that probation has lots of different functions, but in terms of thinking about rehabilitation, there's uh, a lot of work looking at this area, um, particularly by uh, Fergus McNeil and other colleagues which tends to identify that there, where there is a focus on rehabilitation in probation practice, it's tended to focus on the personal, the individual, and sometimes a deficit-based model. Whereas there's broader areas of rehabilitation, uh, which probation should be focusing on in terms of people's legal rehabilitation, 
uh, social rehabilitation and uh, moral rehabilitation in terms of uh, making good or paying back. Um, within that framework also, um, we've thought about this kind of principle of proportionality and productiveness in terms of uh, probation uh, work as well. So just to kind of situate that, I don't know, Randa, the slides show in at this point. Yeah, we can see them. I think they're a bit behind where you are. OK, so I'm just on staffing context now, which is uh, number seven. Um, yeah, so. yeah, great, thank you. Um, so I think in any discussions about good community sentences, and we know that there is a government proposal at the moment to basically increase the numbers of people on under some form of community sentences um, by with the usual pressure around reducing the prison population. And I think all of this has to be situated within the overall staffing context of probation in England and Wales. Um, the current or the most recent statistics, uh, while there has been a big emphasis on recruitment uh, into probation, particularly on PQIP training and the expansion of that, which is positive, of course, um, there currently is still a shortfall of, um, according to the latest data, of 2,000 full-time um, probation officer staff. Um, so the required level, according to the MOJ or HMPPS themselves, is uh, almost uh, 7,000. And there are almost 5,000 staff in, in post in probation officer level. Alongside that, uh, there are issues around staffing and uh, sickness levels and absence. Um, so I think we need to we need to situate our thinking in relation to that context. Um, so thinking about the working context, then um, if it's the next slide, slide Miranda, please. Um, Obviously, as people all know, there's been a significant period of organisational change, uh, staff or turnover, changing staff profile and issues around um, the role expectations of what people are required to do. And the quotes I'm just um, including on these slides here are from our um, second wave of data collection with staff in our case study area. So basically uh, from their perspective from last year. Uh, and this is from one of the managers in a PDU in which we conducted our field work, uh, who said that the majority of staff here are currently set in caseloads of about 130 to 150. You know what they're meant to have. Somehow they've got to pl pluck 16 hours worth of work out of nowhere. Um, now, this staffing context and caseloads does vary across the country. But I think it's a really important contextual point to note in terms of what a good community sentence is if we think about uh, people's caseloads and ability to be able to work meaningfully with people or indeed with hope, as, as Jake has been pointing out. Um, the knock-on effects of these uh, staffing shortfalls or high caseloads, um, it's next slide, Miranda, is um, issues around uh, long-term sickness, uh, people going off sick, and then this kind of domino type effect where um, because people go off sick in a particular office, or a particular uh, probation delivery unit, there's a knock-on effect of other staff in terms of having to pick up um, caseloads and so forth. Um, so last year, we've been particularly looking at uh, the experiences of PQIP trainees as well in our case study area, and they'd come on stream last year. And this is just the perspective of one of those trainees who talks about, uh, there's always been somebody off six since I started. Uh, and it's just been constant. I don't think there's been a time where I've been here when I haven't seen someone off sick, which is a bit intimidating as a PQIP. Now, of course, as well as the impacts for staff, uh, there's impacts for people on probation. Uh, it's the next slide, Miranda. And um, this particular PQIP trainee reflects upon the fact that, you know, the fact that um, there's changes within the workforce, there's people off sick and so forth, means that people on probation in the particular office where she's working in are seeing someone different every week. And she reflects that from her own perspective, she wouldn't want to be um, seeing someone different for over three weeks and having to retell stories the whole time, particularly when there's issues of trauma and distress in people's lives, which is obviously um, a factor for um, some people um, come into probation. Um, alongside that, um, what some of the staff talk about in our uh, research is this um, pressure on processes and deadlines, um, the movement towards target cultures. Um, so again, reflecting these are a, a different or 
to uh, peak group trainees talking about you're constantly battling with what you came into the job to do and what's actually expected of you. Um, the probation service in general seems to concentrate on its process and timelines and targets. And another trainee talks about it. it's just been like a conveyor belt, like a meat factory. So in terms of thinking about the, our overall topic about meaningful or uh, good community sentences, Obviously, um, accountability and targets have been important in terms of um, oversight, uh, inspection of services, highlighting issues with regard to resourcing and so forth. But there's a real kind of disjuncture or disconnect between what um, some staff are identifying in terms of the kind of processing they have to do and this question or this imagery of a, of a meat factory here and the kind of sense in which uh, meaningful work can occur. The other issue that has been dominant, uh, particularly last year when we were carrying out interviews and it came out, I think, in what Jake was just presenting there as well, is uh, the impact of a kind of anxiety or a culture of anxiety, particularly around uh, the impact of serious further offences, uh, which is the next slide, Miranda. So um, last year when we were conducting um, our research, uh, there have been a number of high profile SFOs, serious further offences. And um, they were very much at the forefront of the mind of virtually all the staff that we spoke to in the case study region. Uh, they weren't necessarily directly involved in any of these SFOs. In fact, they weren't for the most part. But that kind of ripple effect in terms of people feeling that they had to kind of watch their back in terms of uh, keeping case notes up to date. And, and here um, people talk about staff being motivated by fear, which is never good, a manager reflecting. And again, um, peak of trainees talking about it being probably one of the biggest anxieties in their job currently. Uh, moving on uh, to the next slide, um, one of the things that we asked people about was their reflections on um, the kind of ambition set out and the target operating model, which is uh, people will be familiar with, is the kind of vision for how probation services would operate in a post unification landscape. And within that model, there's a, a model articulated around probation role being about assessing, protecting and changing. So we asked staff what they thought about this. Do they see this as a particular feature of the work and what they understood about the particular aspect of this model? So if we move on to the next slide, um, Randa, please. Um, staff reflected on, you know, yes, we can we can make sense of a model that talks about assess, protect and change. But what really is interesting uh, is that we spend a lot on the assessment and protection piece and much less on the change bit. Um, this particular uh, manager, Victoria, talks about the change bit is interesting because there's nothing about care, which I think resonates with some of what Jake was talking about a moment ago. And she reflected that she saw the service more as a law enforcement agency as opposed to being agents that advocate for people who need us to. Uh, again, a trainee talks about probation as paperwork, probation as the deadlines, and that's not the tagline. Um, so moving on to the next slide, um, a lot of staff, and I think this very much resonates with what Jake has just talked about, reflected on the fact that um, when asked to talk about this model and what they saw the role of probation being, that they saw that public protection will always outweigh rehabilitation at the end of the day and also reflecting on changes incoming in relation to one HMPPS, uh, a fear that the prison service would be taking over probation and really use probation as a way to empty the prisons. Um, so that's, you know, somewhat bleak in terms of what we're thinking about here, but we also asked um, within the, the data and what people thought uh, about what potentially were good practices. So moving on to the, the next slide. Um, this is a PQIP trainee talking about what she found alongside the kind of paperwork and all the rest, uh, inspiration aspects of practice. So when she talks about when you move past lip service, when you have a meaningful engagement with someone, when you know, and she puts it like this, they're on the home run without their stabilizers and you like, you've got this now, just run with it. I think that's probation. Another uh, manager with longer term experiences talks about, um, talked about when we get it right, we do a really good job of it when other agencies are involved. And she in particular reflected on the integrated offender management model, which she thought was a, a particularly good aspect of practice. 
but at the same time reflecting on the fact uh, later on in this particular interview that this particular model and that kind of wraparound is um, reserved for um, clients whom or people on probation whom are assessed as being higher risk and that there are potential gaps in terms of different risk levels. Um, other practitioners uh, spoke about, um, moving on to the next slide, the strengthening of service user engagement and in particular uh, some examples of practices being pulled through from uh, CRCs as being something that was quite positive and an area to be built on. So these were some of the aspects of good practice that practitioners identified. But just to conclude, um, I think nobody on this call who's familiar with probation work won't uh, be familiar with the significant structural and organisational challenges. Obviously, staff are integral to service delivery and to the idea of what a good community sentence would be. But there are issues from a staff perspective uh, of where the emphasis lies and very much a kind of feeling that the, the pendulum had very much swung towards public protection and that uh, emphasis on the more rehabilitative aspects of work were somehow um, um, seen as, as less important just in those broader structural challenges. But nonetheless, uh, within um, our study as well, uh, there is scope uh, for development and, and scope for thinking about some of these wider issues. So I think I'll end at that point and hopefully uh, we'll be able to have some time for discussion. So thank you. And sorry about the slides. Thanks, Nicola. I know you're going at 100 <laughs> miles an hour at the end there and, and, and much appreciated. Okay. We, uh, we do have um, 15 minutes for questions. So I'm still waiting for anyone that, that wants to ask those. So I, I think perhaps I'll, I'll start us off because I think you gave us a very rounded view of what the kind of situation is at, at the moment, but also some real hope for the future. Um, and just as for me, probation has always historically been a kind of compact that someone has to consent to be supervised, but that the quid pro quo is that is that you would have someone uh, to help you to, to support you, to advocate you, to get some of the help you need and to work with and alongside you to work out how you might take more control of your life in, in a positive direction. And it, it feels at the moment, partly because of resources and but partly because of the emphasis on um, on risk is kind of outweighing the other things. So kind of going forward, I don't know if you've got kind of ideas of or come across particular positive ways in which some um, probation teams, probation officers or some people on probation are seeing a, a more positive rebalancing of the service going uh, forwards. Um, I mean, I definitely, you know, there there are definitely examples and and from um, from the data that we've collected uh, and particular initiatives, you know, the the engaging people on probation and the rollout of that um, in terms of a, a strategy, in terms of the work that's been done, I, I think is potentially very positive. I mean, obviously, one can have questions about what it means to engage and the extent of meaningful engagement and all those kind of um, ideas there, which I think are really important areas to consider. But I think that kind of um, idea that um, people's experiences, uh, their feedback, um, the potential role of peer mentors and, and all these kind of areas are really, really positive areas uh, for development and probation. And I really do see an emphasis on that. There is the constraint of resourcing and um, at the moment, at least from the perspective of the data that we have, it's in pockets and it doesn't necessarily permeate at the moment to our practice, I would say. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. I, Jake, any thoughts? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. I think what's really a bit, staffing and like resources and workloads always like gets thrown in the way here. And, and obviously it's really important and you can't expect staff to do uh, what they want to do or what they need to do when they are so uh, overworked. Uh, but I think it's also really helpful to think about, well, what does the service have some control over and what can it change even within those kind of like resource uh, constraints? And it's like, you know, there is scope there for thinking about, you know, a cultural, you know, shift away from this really heavy emphasis on 
kind of risk management and risk assessment in a really kind of short term way. Most of the people that I've ever spoken to in research, not just in this project, you know, would say that, you know, the way to long term, you know, change for people is not just through managing their risk on a on a, in a very kind of incapacitative way, but it's to work with them properly and create kind of substantive change. There are things out there that we know, you know, are really promising and um, stuff I've done been doing recently around kind of uh, professional curiosity. I see really clear where, where people are working in it, where there's an infrastructure for good working together and good information sharing and extra resources and capacity within a system. It works better. Yeah, so so the service can put those kind of infrastructures in place uh, or, you know, research I've done around, you know, kind of multi agency hub based kind of delivery models, you know, they, they seem to have really positive effects uh, for people. Um, so it's about drawing on that innovation, I guess, that Nicola was talking about and, and making the most of that. Thanks, Jake. <clears throat> uh, the kind of method to ask a question in the webinar is to put your question in the Q&A section, but I can see that Gemma Sanders has got a hand up, so um, I'm, I'm going to ask you, Gemma, just to ask your question briefly to get us started. Yeah, I think it's not um, a question such as I think I am actually a prohibition practitioner. I qualified from PQIP in December, so I'm feeling everything that I've, everyone's been saying today. I think a lot of it is about attitudes as well. So our, our aim is to protect the public. That is the fundamental underpinning role of a probation service. But it's how we do that. And I think for me, looking at person focused, looking at that strength, looking at the individual and what we can do to help them. Surely the only default for that is to protect the public because by giving people that autonomy and that reason to move forward, giving them that hope, and not just the thought of hope, but the actual experience of it, will by default make our job easier. We'll get a better response from it, from the people that we work with, but we will then again protect public and reduce the offending. Thanks, Gemma. Jake or Nicola, would you like to comment on that? Uh, I just just to say, yeah, absolutely, totally agree. Um, I think it is about having that confidence, I guess, and also that time to be able to do that. And from an organisational perspective, uh, the willingness to take the risk that that's going to perhaps take longer to come to fruition in terms of, a, you know, a real tangible uh, improvement to public protection, I guess. Yeah. Thanks, Jake, and, and, and thanks, Gemma. Um, you both kind of picked up this feeling of anxiety amongst probation practitioners and fear. I, I think, if I'm getting it right, of being scapegoated, really, for when things go wrong. Um, <clears throat> and that's clearly a big anxiety for um, officials and ministers as, as well. But I, I wonder if um, it, it seems to me, and I'd be interested in your comments, that it's a lot easier to track kind of uh, the bureaucracy that goes with risk protection, whether you've done the risk management plan, whether you've done that in a timely way, et cetera, whereas clearly um, tracking change is a more complex, a more up and down, a more long term. And I wonder if you think there's, there's room for HMPPS to devolve more kind of locally, but also to practitioners to actually follow through on the professional curiosity and say, well, you're trained professionals. We do expect, you know, certain standards and requirements. However, we trust your professional judgment on how best to achieve a positive outcome alongside this person. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, I kind of agree. I think um, it makes me think of some of the research that I did on uh, inspection, I guess, and how um, I think from my my impression from talking to people uh, is that the the anxiety that comes from uh, the scapegoating is 
as much to do with the way in which that takes place. So the way in which SFO reviews are done and the way in which auditing is done rather than necessarily whether they are or aren't uh, to blame. And um, something that I found when I did my research with practitioners about inspection was that they really valued those case interviews with inspectors. Yeah, they were nerve wracking. They, they wouldn't want to do one every day, but uh, they were an opportunity to at least talk through with, you know, an expert who, you know, mostly has had experience of working in probation and talk through and justify some of those decisions and have a kind of a voice in the process, in the accountability and regulatory uh, process. And so inspection, I think, was experienced as a less blamey thing than SFO reviews uh, from what I uh, gather. Now, I know with an SFO review, something has definitely gone wrong. Whereas with an inspection case in interview, they haven't, but there's still, you know, examples of regulatory activities. And, and I think that's an interesting point, Jake, because clearly the SFOs that hit the press, things have gone wrong. Mm. However, it's entirely possible to supervise someone responsibly and professionally and properly and for someone still to commit a serious further offence yeah, you know it's, it's a it's a human process and I think it's starting from that kind of open point and obviously holding people to account where things haven't been done or resources haven't been available but also to say you know so I think almost to acquit people <laughs> to say well no you know that's there's a clear rationale for that. You've looked at the evidence, you've taken the time, you've considered it. It's, <clears throat> you know, because we are setting this in a context in which more people than ever before are recalled to prison. And I think part of that is clearly about, well, if I don't recall and someone does commit an offence, um, is it my fault and will I lose my job as a result? And it, these are clearly very difficult judgments. But they are not unique, you know, child protection, social workers have to make similar um, decisions as do people in the medical professions. So I think it's something about supporting and having and, and really kind of leadership in supporting people and say, yes, we will hold people to account when they've not done their job. But when they have done their job, we, we will say we will back them and say, you know, we're enormously sorry, but this wasn't the fault of an individual. I mean, one of, just on the point that you were making there as well, um, Russell slightly kind of building on it, but, you know, the question of what's easy to measure or what's measurable and what isn't, um, I think also relates to um, practitioners having a voice in processes as well. Um, you know, one of the things that we we kind of explore as well is who, where are the voices for probation or of probation? And I think there certainly amongst practitioners a kind of sense of you know that the that their voice isn't particularly loud in a lot of these processes. Um, um, so I think there's something to be said as well about practitioners being able to articulate and um, have a platform to talk about the challenges and, and um, complexities of work that isn't just about individual accountability in that way. Um, I think that they're kind of particularly important areas to develop. I know there is work around, you know, reflective supervision and, and various different aspects going on um, that I think is 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 really positive in, in terms of, of thinking about that. So I see that Tammy has asked in the chat about, you know, what practical tips would you recommend uh, for a frontline practitioner feeling overwhelmed? Um, um, just want to give people some hope. Small changes can and do make a difference. So I think it's just important to highlight that as well. Lovely. Thank you very much, Jake and uh, Nicola. I'm very sorry if um, I didn't get to your question at the end there. Just to remind you that this and all the other videos in this series will be online. There will be um, a series of further events across the year. Thank you very much for giving up your lunchtime and joining us. And of course, thanks most of all to uh, Nicola and Jake for sharing what is very current and ongoing research. So thanks very much, everybody.